Hello everyone from WHO headquarters here in Geneva. It's uh, June 3rd. My name is Tarek and we welcome you for the regular press conference on COVID-19. Uh, welcome to everyone watching us on a number of our social media platforms and to all journalists who are watching us on Zoom who can uh, click raise mm -hmm. hand and uh, they will uh, uh, be uh, able to ask uh, the question later. We thank our interpreters who are here with us today and who uh, help uh, to have a simultaneous interpretation in six UN languages plus Portuguese plus Hindi. Journalists who are on the Zoom can ask uh, questions in uh, six UN languages and the Zoom. We have with us today Dr. Tedros, WHO Director General, uh, Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, uh, Dr. Mike Ryan, and Dr. Sumya Swaminathan, our chief. Uh, scientists. So I will give the floor uh, to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. WHO is continuing to respond to the new Ebola outbreak in the city of Mbandaka in the Equator province of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So far, eight cases have been detected. Four of those have died, and other four are receiving care. To be clear, this outbreak is in the same area as a previous outbreak in 2018, which was stopped in just three months. However, it's on the other side of the country to the Ebola outbreak that WHO and partners have been fighting for almost two years in the provinces of North Kivu and Ituri in eastern DRC. The latest person confirmed with Ebola attended the burial of one of the first cases, but was detected in the town of Bikoro, 150 kilometers away from Bandaka. This means that two health zones are now affected. Today, almost 50 responders from WHO and partners arrived in Bandaka, plus 3,600 doses of Ebola vaccine and 2,000 cartridges for lab testing. The government is now sequencing the virus to see whether or not it's related to a previous outbreak. This is an important reminder that even as WHO focuses on responding to COVID-19 pandemic, we continue to monitor and respond to many other health emergencies. More than 100,000 cases of COVID-19 have been reported to WHO for each of the past five days. The Americas continues to account for the most cases. For several weeks, the number of cases reported each day in the Americas has been more than the rest of the world put together. We're especially worried about Central and South America, where many countries are witnessing accelerating epidemics. We also see increasing numbers of cases in the Eastern Mediterranean, Southeast Asia, and Africa, although the numbers are much smaller. Meanwhile, the number of cases in Europe continues to decline. Yesterday saw the fewest cases reported in Europe since the 22nd of March. WHO continues to work through our regional and country offices to monitor the pandemic, to support countries to respond, and to adapt our guidance for every situation. WHO continues to provide the world with new and updated technical guidance based on the most up-to-date evidence. Just in the past week, WHO has released a new case report form for suspected cases of multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children operational guidance on maintaining essential health services, guidance on controlling the spread of COVID-19 at ground crossings, planning recommendations for mass gatherings, a protocol for surveillance of infectious infections among health workers, ethical considerations for the use of digital technologies in tracking COVID-19, and updated guidelines on the clinical management of patients with COVID-19. This is an update 
of the guideline we published in March. It includes a COVID-19 care pathway, which describes the steps followed by a patient from screening to discharge to ensure delivery of safe and quality care while stopping onward transmission. WHO continues to train millions of health workers all over the world to apply our guidance. Our openwho.org online learning platform has now registered 3 million enrollments for our courses on COVID-19. And we have added two new courses, one on decontamination and sterilization of medical devices, and another on environmental cleaning and disinfection. In total, we're now offering 12 courses in 27 languages. In the past week, we launched COVID-19 courses in Amharic, Arabic, French, Hausa, Macedonian, Odia, Spanish, and Vietnamese. As you know, last week, the executive group of the Solidarity Trial decided to implement a temporary pause of the hydroxychloroquine arm of the trial because of concerns raised about the safety of the drug. This decision was taken as a precaution while the safety data were reviewed. The Data Safety and Monitoring Committee of the Solidarity Trial has been reviewing the data. On the basis of the available mortality data, the members of the committee recommended that there are no reasons to modify the trial protocol. The executive group received this recommendation and endorsed the continuation of all arms of solidarity trial, including hydroxychloroquine. The executive group will communicate with the principal investigators in the trial about resuming hydroxychloroquine arm of the trial. The data safety and monitoring committee will continue to closely monitor the safety of all therapeutics being tested in the solidarity trial. So far, more than 3,500 patients have been recruited in 35 countries. WHO is committed to accelerating the development of effective therapeutics, vaccines, and diagnostics as part of our commitment to serving the world with science, solutions, and solidarity. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tedros, for these opening remarks. Uh, we will uh, proceed with the questions. I would ask uh, journalists to be uh, short, concise, and to have only one question so we can take as many as possible, and to remind you that you can ask questions in six different languages and Portuguese, if that is easier for you. So if uh, we are okay, we will start uh, with a reporter from uh, Saudi Arabia, we have uh, Mohammed Al Haidar online from Riyadh uh, News Agency. Mohammed, uh, can you hear us? Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me? Sauti Wadah, Sauti Wadah. Yes. Good day, good afternoon. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to take the floor and for giving me the opportunity to pose questions. Now, my question is to do with hydroxychloroquine. Certain countries have stopped the use of this medicine and we have seen a rise in cases in particular in intensive care units and also in terms of the number of deaths. There are certain countries that continue to use this medicine and these countries have uh, these countries have seen a rise or they've seen improvements. So what can you say with regard to this contradiction? Thank you. Maybe I, I can start and uh, Dr. Sumia can supplement. I, I think uh, 
uh, while I, 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 I respect the the um, <clears throat> the, uh, the spirit of your question, I think we need to be very careful in making associations uh, like you've just made, because to assume that uh, the use or not of a drug in general in a country is resulting in increases or decreases of cases is not something uh, that, uh, that one can do, quite frankly. Uh, what we have done as WHO and many other researchers around the world <clears throat> and national authorities have done is put in place randomized control trials in order to test which drugs are effective and which drugs actually help patients and save lives. Um, we thank all our partners around the world who are participating in the solidarity trials, uh, but there are other recovery trials and other discovery trials happening <clears throat> right around the world to look at what are the most effective uh, drugs uh, in, in, in use uh, right now against COVID-19. With regard to the specific issue of hydroxychloroquine in this trial, uh, Sumia may wish to, to add more detail regarding that. I think just to add uh, to what uh, Mike said, as of now, there's no evidence that any drug actually reduces the mortality in um, patients who have COVID-19, and in fact, it's an urgent priority for all of us to do the needed studies, to do the randomized clinical trials in order to get that evidence as quickly as possible. So WHO is very much in favor of and encourages the continuation of randomized trials that are looking at, at different drugs to reduce mortality. Uh, but also to reduce the um, severity of the illness. And these are the big public health questions that uh, we are trying to answer. And, I th and, and again, to repeat what we've been saying all along, observational studies have limitations. Um, you can do analyses, uh, but there are so many um, potential biases in the way that you know, patients are managed in a regular clinical setting that the only way to get definitive answers is to do well-conducted randomized trials, and it's particularly important in emergency uh, settings to do these because that's the only way to find out what really are the, those um, drugs or those strategies that will reduce death, that will reduce uh, illness, that will reduce infection rates in communities. And we should be guided by the science and by the evidence. Many thanks for this. Uh, now we will go to uh, Brazil, to uh, Lara Pinheiro from uh, Globo. Uh, Lara. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, good afternoon, thank you for taking my question. Um, my question is actually about um, the new drug, which Russia claims they have, um, which Russia actually approves to, to treat COVID-19 and they claimed it was effective against it, but um, I, I want to know what um, the current position of WHO is. And also, um, they said that the number of patients tested for it, it was 330 people. I wanted to know also if this was a big enough sample to actually um, test a drug's effectiveness. Thank you. So we have received uh, information that uh, avifavir, avifavir, which is similar to favipiravir, has been uh, tested and that the drug that's actually been created by the Russian Direct Investment Fund in conjunction with the Chemical Diversity Research Institute will be um, provided in Russian hospitals uh, very soon. Um, we, it was, it's been developed and tested in clinical trials in Russia and we would very much like to see um, and would be keen to see the results of those uh, trials and are eager to know if there are drugs that are effective and safe for the use of COVID-19 patients. Mary, Mary or Mike might like to add anything. But that's the information that we have uh, at the moment. Thank you, Dr. Swaminathan. Uh, next question comes from All Africa News uh, and we have uh, Tami online. Hello, Tammy. Uh, would you be able to unmute yourself, please? Hello, yes. Yes, it's okay now. We can hear you. 
among the many reasons that you are trying so many therapies and trials for COVID-19, including hydroxychloroquine, if it can be done safely, and our counseling caution in lifting lockdowns too quickly, is one the danger that the more the virus spreads, the greater the likelihood that it could become more dangerous? I mean, can you just... Uh... The, repeat the question. You just got broken at the end of, uh, of, your, of your question. Yes, sorry. Uh, you heard the first of the first. Uh, Tammy, I'm, I'm afraid we lost you. Are, are you still with us? I am with you. Okay, can please. You hear me? Now, now we can. Let, let's try one more time. Please, uh, just uh, the final part of your question. Okay, just the last part is, is among the reasons that you're doing all the things that you're doing, the fact, the danger that the more the virus spreads, the greater the likelihood that it could mutate and like, make it more dangerous? Or is that a concern behind the many therapies you're trying and the and the advice that you're giving on various levels. Thank you very much, Tammy. We, we finally uh, got the question. Thank you, Tammy, for the question. I'll start and, and perhaps others would like to um, supplement. I mean, the first part of your question around um, as, the, as it, the more the virus spreads, there's the more of a chance that it can mutate. Um, we've, we've been discussing um, here at these pressers that there's a large number of scientists and virologists who are looking at full genome sequences of the virus that are available, that are being shared by countries all over the world. Um, there are more than uh, 40,000 full genome sequences that are available. Some of those are available on GISAID, and some of those are available on other platforms in which scientists are looking to see, are there changes in, in the virus? Um, and as it is a, a coronavirus, it is an RNA virus, there are normal changes in this virus that one would expect over time. None of these changes so far indicate um, that the virus itself is changing in terms of its ability to transmit or to cause more severe disease. Um, but there are many people who are looking at this and are looking at the, the fine details of the sequence itself um, to follow up and to d discuss whether or not any of these changes can reflect a change in its behavior. But I do think an important point not related to the sequence and your question about with the more time that this virus circulates, can it become more dangerous? And I think part of that answer is yes because people grow tired, you know, people, it's very difficult to keep up all of these measures and we must, you know, remain strong and vigilant to have governments fully engaged and people fully engaged. Um, as these lockdowns are lifted, that has to be done in a slow way. And in some situations, these measures, these public health and social me measures may need to be reintroduced again. Um, and that may uh, frustrate people. Um, which is completely understandable. And that, in a sense, could make the virus more dangerous because people become complacent. And it's important that no one becomes complacent. This is far from over, uh, and we must continue to practice the hand hygiene and the respiratory etiquette, the physical distancing, uh, listening to our leaders in terms of the measures that they have put in place. Stay home if you're unwell. Um, you know, and, and those are the types of measures that must remain uh, in place. And so it's just more of a, a, a caution that it could become more dangerous if we become complacent. But the virus itself is stable, is relatively stable. There are changes that are expected, but they aren't changing, they aren't mutating in a way that makes the virus more transmissible or more severe. Yeah, if I could just supplement because um, uh, Dr. Ted was sitting beside me here, has been saying again and again and again that this is a dangerous, dangerous virus. Uh, it is dangerous enough as it is, um, and that's why we're fighting it. Um, all viruses evolve. They can evolve in one direction, they can evolve in the other direction. RNA viruses uh, uh, do uh, mutate uh, more quickly or evolve more quickly because uh, unlike us humans who live with DNA that corrects itself, our code can correct itself, RNA viruses don't have that natural error checking that goes on. And that gives them a disadvantage and an advantage. The disadvantage is uh, they make a lot of mistakes and many uh, of the viruses don't thrive or survive. But very occasionally, a mutation 
uh, can lead to a virus becoming more effective in transmission or more virulent or less effective in transmission. And in general, uh, in human uh, infection, viruses tend to evolve to live with humans rather than do more damage. That would be a general process of viral adaptation because it's not in the virus interest to do too much damage in the host. It wants to survive. Uh, having said that, uh, the, as Maria said, the, the world's virologists <clears throat> are tracking this virus on a daily basis. To date, to my knowledge, we haven't seen any particular signal in the, in the virus's behaviour or its, in, in its sequence that would lead us to believe that the virus is changing in its nature, has changed in its transmission dynamics or changed in its lethality or virulence. As, as a, a, vir a virologist would call it. So in that sense, no, we're not seeing that. But we are tracking that. It's an important issue, as Maria said. But this is already a dangerous virus. Uh, and we've been saying that consistently for months now. Many thanks. Uh, uh, we will go now to Mexico and uh, Paulina Alcazar from Encadena. Paulina. Hello, Hello. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Thank you. In Cancun, we are already, as we said last week, um, following recommendations and opening up. And I wonder, being out in the open, um, in the nature, in natural areas, uh, Cancun, uh, Tulum, and so on, will that uh, stop uh, the uh, spread of the virus? Um, I can. Uh, begin and Maria can follow. Um, I think the, 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 this virus spreads from person to person uh, by the droplet or respiratory route or often by the contamination of uh, surfaces by someone who has, has symptoms um, or someone who's shedding the virus. Uh, so in that sense, uh, being out in the open is a very good thing. Uh, being out in the open air um, is a very good thing. It's good for one's general health, and I think it's, uh, it's good for avoiding uh, infection as well. Uh, as long as you're not out in the open with uh, thousands of other people crowded together, uh, then uh, yes, it's a, it's a good thing in, in general for, for health. And uh, so uh, we could only encourage people in the right circumstances uh, that that happens. And as countries open up, uh, we're seeing more and more parks and other uh, amenities are being opened to people. But I think it is important that you listen to local authorities. They have to manage these public spaces, and they're precious public spaces, but they also have to keep those public spaces safe and allow people to mix in a safe way. So uh, yes, we should be using nature to heal ourselves and uh, to, to heal our communities, but we also need to uh, abide by the uh, by the public health advice uh, that the authorities give for the use of those amenities. Maria. Many thanks. We will go to India today now. Uh, we have Ankit uh, with us. Uh, hello, Ankit. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Uh, what do you have to say on the AP report published uh, earlier, which cited internal WHO recordings and claim that, in your own view, China delayed providing the details? Uh, to the WHO by at least two weeks. Is the report factual, and what is your response to this? Thank you. Um, our leadership and staff have worked night and day in compliance with the organization's rules, regulations, to support and share information with our member states equally and engage in frank and forthright conversations with governments at all levels. That's what I would like to say. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ryan, for this. Uh, uh, let's try to have Isabel from FA News Agency. Isabel? Hello. Do you hear me? Yes. Uh, gracias. Gracias. Thank you. My question is, why is the situation so bad in South America? and in Central America, in spite of the fact that um, many of the countries in the region have taken um, measures and taken them very early, including strict lockdowns. And a related question is, as far as we know about the behavior of the 
virus in other parts of the world, what would you recommend to Latin American governments to stop the spread of the virus? I can, I can begin. <clears throat> I think, first of all, when we look at Latin America in general, it's important, uh, and, 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 and the Americas in general, it's important to distinguish that, the, as happened in Europe, as happened in, in Southeast Asia, the epidemic is not at the same stage of development in each and every country. Uh, the small island states in the Caribbean have done a superb job in containing the virus and in, in stopping disease and in saving lives. But we are very concerned about Haiti at the moment because of its unique circumstance, its unique fragility, and the fact that the disease is accelerating in a highly vulnerable population. And I think you can say the same on each sub-region for the Central America. Similarly, we are concerned uh, about uh, the disease situation in, in, in places like Nicaragua. However, we're seeing a different scenario in, in other countries. Um, similarly, in, in, in South America, we see increasing uh, continued intense community transmission in places like Peru and Brazil um, and, and in other countries. Um, the, uh, we, we might have said the same thing a number of weeks ago uh, in, in Europe. Uh, or in North America or other places, why is the situation so bad? The epidemic has developed <clears throat> in each and every region or sub-region in a slightly different way, but what has been common to many regions has been intense community transmission. And it is clear that once that intense community transmission has been established, <clears throat> it's very difficult to root the virus out. <clears throat> and it takes <clears throat> a comprehensive strategy, not just public health and social measures it requires to have uh, a highly involved and empowered community. It requires strong coordination and governance at, at, at government level. It requires an all of society uh, approach. It requires sustained commitment. Uh, and it also, uh, even in those situations, even in those situations, you see particular settings in which the disease can take off and cause a tremendous amount of, 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 of uh, suffering and, and, and death. We see that scenario in Europe and in North America in long-term care facilities. We've seen that emerge uh, in, in, um, in closed settings, uh, in, in uh, detention centers, in, in others. So there are particular settings in which the disease can amplify um, and cause uh, more difficulties. Uh, we've been saying uh, again and advising uh, since uh, the beginning of, of this uh, uh, global epidemic to that it's this ability to implement a whole series of measures across society uh, that, ha that allow a country to, to bring a disease under control, continue to suppress the virus, and ultimately exit all of these measures. We've seen many, many, many good examples of that. And it's not that every country has done the same thing. Uh, what's been remarkable in this is that countries have done slightly different things according to their context. But what countries that have been successful have done is they've taken all of those measures. They've been very serious about community engagement. They've been very, very serious about educating people and bringing the community along with them. They've been clear in their communications. They've let the response be driven by science. They have implemented and tried to sustain surveillance and finding the virus at all times during the response, even though it's very, very difficult when you have very intense transmission. And they have focused on targeting their public health and social measures and sustaining those measures and only lifting those measures when they see indications that they're making progress. So it's not one thing or another. So in terms of advising countries in Central and South America, <clears throat> it's about persistence, it's about consistency, it's about making sure that your messages are clear, making sure your community is on board, uh, and ensuring that uh, you're driven by science, driven by the evidence. That evidence is, lo is global in the sense that there are global uh, facts and, and global knowledge, but it's also local. There's a local context and there's local learning. So there's, we need to adapt global knowledge, but we need to implement with local knowledge as well. And I think countries that have matched the global science uh, with their local knowledge, and they've been consistent and persistent in that, they're the ones that have had success. Um, so there is no absolute recipe for success. There is no SOP, there is no algorithm that gives you success against this virus. Uh, it is a set, a complex set of, um, <clears throat> of actions implemented by responsible governments driven by science who are prepared to sustain their action for as long as it takes to suppress and stop this virus. 
If I might add, just to say, to supplement what Mike has said, that many countries uh, in other parts of the world are exactly where countries in Latin America are right now in seeing some very intense transmission and, and outbreaks, and we can learn from them, um, and we can learn from, from, from each other. And what we've seen in, in many countries where the situation just seemed overwhelming, um, where the, the, it, was, it was unclear where, where exactly the virus is, it just seems like it's everywhere. What we've seen many countries do is target their efforts and prioritize their efforts to, to find out where are the highest, where's the highest concentration of this virus? Where's the highest concentration of um, the, the virus itself circulating? And what we know about this virus is that it likes close contact with people. And when the public health workforce and the testing strategy focuses on um, closed settings and vulnerable people, um, and you start testing those appropriately, and you, and you use your limited supplies and limited workforce in targeted areas, you can start to see the boundaries of where that outbreak actually is. Um, and that really helps focus all of the efforts for the contact tracers, for your testing strategy, um, mobilizing your clinical care facilities to, to care for individuals. And it helps narrow down the problem bit by bit. Um, and tackling this virus at the lowest administrative level as you can is helpful. Looking at it at the, at the national level is one thing and having a strong national plan, but implementing these efforts at the lowest administrative level will be helpful to help you find where the virus is and target what you need uh, to do. Um, another way uh, countries have tried to tackle overwhelming epidemics is to focus on vulnerable workers, vulnerable people. These are our frontline workers. These are healthcare workers, and in Latin America and in many countries across the globe, we see an alarming number of healthcare worker infections um, and an alarming number of healthcare deaths. Um, and so, prioritizing testing there will help you see where the virus is and who's getting infected. Looking at your older populations, looking at people with underlying medical conditions, so that they are prioritized for care, so that we can ensure that those individuals do not develop severe disease and die. Um, and as Mike said, adapting your, your efforts to the situation, to the context in where you live, and to do that at the lowest administrative level as you can, can help break down the problem. Looking at it at a national level is important, but targeting those efforts at the lowest administrative level as you can, can help break down the problem and start to tackle it bit by bit. We will now go to the Swiss uh, public television section in Italian. We have a Riccardo Bagnato with us. Uh, Riccardo, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. It's great. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mr. Ryan, to have read a um, statement about the reportage about the inquiry of AP Associated Press, but uh, still uh, a question. Do you confirm the quotes appearing on this inquiry? According to uh, uh, this inquiry, the, the, the quotes on the, your quotes and Mrs. L. Uh, Kerkhove quotes. And for Director General, please, um, do you confirm? Do you confirm that China delayed releasing coronavirus info as written on this inquiry? Thank you, Ricardo. I think, uh, you know, Dr. Ryan already answered this question. So unless there is something else uh, that uh, our speakers would like to add, uh, we will move to a, a next question. We have uh, Elena Sanchez from uh, EU Observer. Elena, can you hear us? Uh, can you unmute yourself, Elena? Can you hear me? Yes, now it's okay. Uh, yeah, actually, it's a follow-up uh, on the question of my colleague uh, just made. Um, I don't want the confirmation exactly on the topic, but I was wondering more how this kind of reports uh, can affect actually the relationship between uh, China and, and, and the WHO. Well, I think uh, the answer will be just the same as this to our friend Ricardo from Swiss uh, TV that uh, what uh, that um, Dr. Ryan has, uh, has uh, uh, made a statement on this particular topic. So unless there is a something else to add, we will move to uh, Health Policy Watch. Uh, we have a Grace, uh, Gracie, sorry, Gracie online. Gracie? Okay. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, thank you so much for taking my question. Um, so I have a question regarding the 
recommendations for public use of facial coverings. So the SAGE Infectious Hazards Group uh, released recommendations saying that basically um, facial coverings, supporting the use of facial coverings by the general public, especially for uh, public transportation or you know, just conducting like daily tasks outside. Um, and I was wondering if the WHO is planning on updating official guidance on mask use to follow those recommendations. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for that question. Uh, yes, indeed, SAGE, uh, not SAGE, excuse me, the STAG, uh, the St Strategic Advisory Committee for Infectious Hazards, did release uh, some notes from a meeting that they had. Um, and we are planning to update and release new guidance on, on the advice of the use of masks uh, in the coming days. Um, but just to outline that WHO works with a large number of groups, including the STAG, um, as well as uh, expert networks that are global expert networks and guideline development committees and civil societies to evaluate all available literature on a variety of topics, including the use of masks. Um, but I think what is important is from our uh, April 6th guidance, um, what we did put out and what we continue to say is that masks alone are not enough. Masks must be used as part of a comprehensive strategy for COVID-19, including all of these public health measures, test, treat, isolate, uh, trace, and quarantine contacts, all of these measures. Um, and in our April 6th guidance, what we did is outline a number of situations and support for decision makers in taking decision about how and where masks could potentially be used. Um, and in that guidance, we outlined areas and settings um, where, for example, physical distancing couldn't be achieved that a mask could be considered. And so we are seeing a number of countries across the world now adopting that and indeed using our guidance um, and making decisions to say in situations where we can't do these public health measures and we can't do physical distancing, a mask would be useful. And so we're actually trying to track that to see with masks but with all of the interventions that countries are using um, and how this is adopted at the country, at the national and in, indeed the subnational level. But we will be issuing guidance in the coming days. And just to add, in, in that context, uh, and as, uh, to confirm what Maria said, we have said in this presser on a number of occasions that we would uh, fully support countries implementing broader use of masks in specific contexts um, as part of a comprehensive uh, strategy. Our concerns were using masks as an alternative to all of the other measures. Masks should be additive to the risk management process. There is no <clears throat> zero risk, unfortunately, in this fight against uh, COVID-19. We're all <clears throat> experiencing that as we move back to work, we move back to school. Uh, everyone is concerned. What, is the uh, what, what are the risks? How can I reduce risk? How can I manage the risk to me or my family? We see masks as part of that continuum of risk management, not as an alternative to public health intervention, not as an alternative to physical distancing, not as an alternative to surveillance, not as an alternative to lockdowns but as part of a comprehensive evidence-driven strategy to um, be able to <clears throat> rebuild our economies and rebuild our, our societal interactions. And in specific reference to the use of face coverings in, at general population level, and Maria is right, I mean, we'll be, and the team will be uh, issuing updated guidelines across a range of issues related to masks, not just community use of masks, but I also think masks in other settings and, and uh, but with regard to the use of mass at community level, they would mainly be used for the purposes of source control. In other words, for people who may be infectious, uh, reducing the chances that they would infect someone else. And I would again reiterate that if someone is sick, if someone is symptomatic, they should be at home or they should be in a medical care facility. Um, and therefore, we need to be really, really careful with the use of masks for source to control. There are always situations in which someone is unaware of their symptoms and then the use of masks for source, source control could be a useful additive. But it is not an alternative. And let me say it again, it is not an alternative. Symptomatic individuals moving about within our communities is not a good thing. And masks are not an adequate way of managing that risk. The adequate way of managing that risk is supporting that symptomatic person with adequate care, ensuring that we identify all of their contacts, that their contacts quarantine for 14 days and support it in that quarantine. Uh, and in that context, that is the primary and best way to manage, as Maria said, to break the chains of transmission. Masks are 
uh, a potentially important adjunct, and many countries are using that in a very, very measured and a very, very credible and a very, very uh, responsible way. And our, I think our guidance will, will reflect that responsible use. Hey, thanks, uh, Dr. Ryan. So let's go to the next question. We have Jeremy from uh, RFI. Jeremy? Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Thank you so much for taking my questions. Um, hello to everyone. Uh, I will ask my question in French, if I may. Um, uh, suite à... Following your announcement about hydroxychloroquine, and the fact that you are reintegrating it into the solidarity trials. Um, is that an approval of hydro hydroxychloroquine? Um, does that mean it's not dangerous? Uh, does that mean that WHO in the next few days may um, actually decide to exclude it again in, in the next couple of days? I think we have to be <clears throat> very careful about uh, how we describe these decisions. So when we announced last week that we were temporarily suspending the enrollment into the hydroxychloroquine arm of the solidarity trial, it was based on some reports of increased mortality that was described uh, in a large group of patients, and, and uh, increased mortality among those taking hydroxychloroquine compared to those who were not. And so the committee took the decision to protect the safety of the trial participants with a abundant caution while we looked at our own data and while other trials, ongoing trials of hydroxychloroquine like recovery in the UK looked at their data, which is a fairly substantial data set of over 11,000 patients. We are now fairly confident not having seen any differences in mortality. The, the data safety monitoring committees of both solidarity and recovery have recommended that the trial can continue. We're still talking about a clinical trial that's testing this drug for its efficacy and safety among patients who are hospitalized with COVID infection. We make recommendations for, for the use, routine use of a drug based on evidence. We have a process. We set up a guideline development group. It reviews all the evidence Systematic reviews are done of both randomized trials and other kinds of evidence that are available. And based on all of that, WHO then recommends the use of a drug or a strategy for a particular disease. This is the standard process. And so decisions taken about a trial are driven by what's happening within that trial. And they are, there are committees like the Data Safety Monitoring Committee or oversight bodies like a steering committee that advise what should be done for that particular trial. And that's very different from making a recommendation for the use of hydroxychloroquine or any other drug for either treatment or for prevention. So like we said, we hope that the ongoing trials will continue till we have definitive answers, because that's what the world needs today. Patient, we owe it to the patients to have a definitive answer on whether or not a drug works or doesn't work, and that can only be done through well-conducted randomized trials. So, so we encourage the other trials to continue, of course, each of them being monitored by their own committees for safety periodically, and that's what we will do. And, um, and it's, it's possible that in the future we, we make other changes in the trial. In fact, that's why it was set up as an adaptive trial design, so that we can add arms and drop arms, but all of that is done based on very careful examination of the data and the evidence. Many thanks. Uh, we have time for one maximum two questions, so let's try to get uh, Gabriela Sotomayor. Uh, Gabriela, can you hear us? Please click on mute. See? 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 I, I, a little bit of echo, but we can hear you. Please go ahead. ¿Me oyen bien? Yes. Can you hear me okay? Thank you very much indeed. Talking about the situation in Latin America, 
And I'm thinking about Mexico in particular, and there is a high mortality rate in uh, places like Mexico City. My question for you is, do you think that um, environmental pollution, which is very high in some cities in our country, may have an impact on uh, the spread of uh, COVID-19 and on the illness in patients? Do you think that high doses of uh, vitamin D and vitamin C could help to strengthen um, people's immune systems so that they could uh, resist the illness more effectively. Perhaps you could comment on that. Thank you very much indeed. On the issue of um, vitamins, <clears throat> I don't believe there's any specific evidence that vitamins prevent or can uh, treat uh, COVID-19. But, however, there are many things that we can do to keep our bodies healthy uh, and will allow us <clears throat> to deal with any infectious disease in a more effective way. So a healthy diet uh, and sometimes supplementing those diets with appropriate vitamins is a very positive way to keep oneself healthy. But I do not think it's possible to say that any particular vitamin concoction or any other, uh, for that matter, uh, is associated with better outcomes in COVID-19. However, I'm sure um, we can uh, uh, refer to, we're, we're tracking so many different studies around the world at the moment uh, on, the, on, the, on the use of specific therapies, but I'm not aware of, of vitamins being used as a supplemental therapy in any of the trials that are currently underway, but we can, we can uh, check that. With regard to air quality, uh, again, I think it, it's, it's difficult to make associations. There's no question that poor air quality is associated with chronic lung disease and chronic obstructive pulmonary, pulmonary disorders. And we do know that people with un underlying chronic conditions of the respiratory system and heart and cardiovascular system have higher mortality rates than this. So it's, 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 it's logical to assume that if someone already has damaged lungs from, uh, from severe uh, outdoor or indoor air pollution, it is logical to assume that they will uh, be more affected by this virus, especially if they become clinically unwell. Uh, I'm not aware, and Maria may correct me on this, I'm not aware of any specific studies that have associated air pollution with worse outcomes, but uh, it's a very interesting uh, avenue of study, and we, we do know uh, that for certainly indoor air pollution is associated with much higher rates of uh, respiratory disease in children and, and sometimes worse outcomes. So there's no question that air pollution uh, plays a role in both the incidence and severity of uh, severe acute respiratory diseases. Uh, I'm just not quite sure whether this has been proven in the case of COVID-19. Maria? So it hasn't uh, yet, but it doesn't mean that those studies aren't, aren't underway. I'm not aware of, of studies specifically looking at um, uh, pollution, but I do, I do want to add to, to what Mike has said, is that we have seen quite substantial reduction in pollution during this pandemic um, with, with the reduction in, in people's movement. Um, we've all seen images of the sky and, and in certain cities that have been quite heavily polluted. Um, and it comes back to something the Director General has said uh, previously and WHO has been saying is not only do we build back better, but we build back greener. Um, and there's an opportunity here um, you know, to use this time to not only help our public health infrastructure and, and work on universal health coverage, but also to have a, have, a, have a safer environment. Because as Mike has said, people with underlying conditions, especially people with chronic uh, cardiovascular disease and chronic respiratory disease, disease, do have a proven higher risk of developing severe disease and death associated with COVID-19. So that is something we do know. Um, and anything that puts people at, a, at an increased risk of developing those chronic conditions will put them at an increased risk for severe COVID-19 disease. Thank you. I think we will conclude here. Um, we will have an audio file available as well as transcript. Uh, we also sent you a number of uh, news releases, uh, feature stories, uh, coming on different topics, not only from the headquarters, but also from our regional offices, as well as invitation for the uh, press conferences that are held by our different regional offices. So you're welcome uh, to listen to that as well. And uh, from my side, I wish you a very nice uh, day and evening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq, and thank you all for joining. Thank you so much.